ain't nobody like him. My title and introduction have been inspired by a sermon I heard several years ago from the late Dr. Larry Brown, longtime pastor of the Victory Baptist Church in North Augusta, South Carolina. But my sermon today is based on my study of another sermon that I've been reading and studying quite a bit lately, and that sermon is the book of Hebrews. You will recall in our introductory lessons on this New Testament book that the book of Hebrews takes on the form and function of an ancient Hebrew sermon. And in the ebb and flow of that sermon, it seems as if the writer has come to a high point, to a zenith and a peak in his proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In South Georgia language, he's been giving deep doctrinal truth for two chapters, and now he just dusts off a spot and decides he's going to rear back and preach. And in so doing, he uses a unique title for the Lord Jesus Christ and calls him the apostle and high priest of our confession. It's a phrase that appears only here in the Word of God. Now, I think it's appropriate that there are some unique titles that are given to Christ and Christ alone. He's called the seed of woman. He's called the day spring from on high. He's called the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the stem of Jesse and the root of David. Titles that are given rightfully only to Jesus Christ. And I say rightfully because there ain't nobody like him. Isaiah affirms this truth no less than six times in the 45th chapter of Isaiah. In Isaiah 45 and verse 5, the old prophet said, I am the Lord. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. Now, I think Adam, God's first created human, would affirm that truth. Adam and Eve placed in a perfect garden by a perfect God. Perfect environment. Perfect rules. Perfect boundaries. Perfect provision. And yet, because of the depravity down in their own human heart, they sinned against God. And what did they do? Did they run to Him for mercy and grace? No. They hid out in the fig leaves of their own human effort. And God did for them in time what he had done before the foundation of the world. God came seeking. God came calling. God came and saved them. How did he do it? He slew an animal and clothed them in the covering and the skin of that animal. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Adam and Eve were excommunicated from the beauty of the Garden of Eden But as they walked out, I think Adam might have said, All we like sheep have gone astray. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And ain't nobody like him. Isaiah 45 in verse 6 and verse 18. God said, I am the Lord and there is none else. Father Abraham would agree with that statement. The man who was a liar and a compromiser fathered a child in an unfortunate tryst outside of his own marriage. And yet God saved him, not because Abraham had something to offer God, but because God had something to offer Abraham. Called him out by grace through faith. And as Abraham came out of the Ur of the Chaldees, he might have said, For it is by grace I have been saved through faith. That not of myself is the gift of God, not of my works, or I might have a tendency to boast in one that there ain't nobody like him. Isaiah 45, 14, surely God is in thee, and there is no other. There is no other God. Moses might want to add his amen. Called out of Egyptian bondage on the night of the Passover, only to find himself down by the banks of the Red Sea, an impassable, impenetrable body of water in front of him, Pharaoh's great army coming up from behind him, when all of a sudden, by the raising of the staff and the power of Almighty God, Moses and all of Israel walked across to safety on dry ground. Can you hear, oh, Miriam take up her tambourine and begin to dance and sing? Moses might want to sing along with the blood of the Passover lamb still caked up under his blood to simply say that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, and there ain't nobody like him. Isaiah 45 verse 21 says, there's no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. 
I can't help but think that King David might want to say amen, standing on the roof of his house, not a peeping Tom, but a peeping David. A life full of lust and adultery, murder, scheming and cover-up. But after he was brought to his senses by the power of the Holy Ghost, David said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou forgave the iniquity of my sin. David might want to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation, and there ain't nobody like him. Isaiah 45, 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. That might be the life verse of the repentant thief on the cross. Can you hear him as he comes into the gates of heaven? I was a condemned criminal, condemned to die on a cross. But with one of my last breaths, all I knew to do was ask Jesus for mercy. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Some of the folks he'd stolen from might have seen him in heaven. Some of the folks he might have killed and sent into eternity might have seen him on the gates of heaven. Hey, repentant thief, how did you get here? I got here because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Have you ever met anybody else like him? Nope, never met anybody like him. Because there ain't nobody like him. For two solid chapters, the anonymous writer of Hebrews has told us some unique things about the God-man, the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And in one verse, chapter 3 and verse 1, he provides several truths about why Jesus stands alone, stands uniquely. Now listen, I've got some education. I know how to say there are some unique and immutable characteristics that belong to God the Son and to God alone. But I'm going to be a bottom shelf preacher to some bottom shelf people today. I've come this way to tell you there ain't nobody like him. Now we see in this one verse three ways in which Jesus is unique. He's unique in what he says, in where he stands, and in who he saves. Jesus is unique. First of all, there ain't nobody like him in what he says. Jesus was, among other things, a preacher. And might I say, he was a preacher's preacher. We'd say he could shuck the corn and shell the peas. I think Jesus knew how to drop the clutch and just rear back and let her fly. When he preached, people said, never a man spake like this man. Now, we don't talk like that in South Georgia. We'd say, "Woo, man can preach. That was some preaching today. In fact, often they would say, he doesn't preach like the preachers we normally listen to. He doesn't talk like our scribes and Pharisees. He preaches like one with power and authority. You know why he preached like he had power and authority? Because he had some power and he had all authority. He said some incredible and powerful things when he walked on the earth. When the man was lowered through the roof, the lovely Lord Jesus looked at him and said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And when the religious crowd objected, he said, So that you may know that I, the Son of Man, have the power on earth to forgive sin. I say to you, my son, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And when he rolled up his mat and headed out the house, walking for the first time, everybody said, We ain't never seen nothing like that before. I'm talking about what he says There was a woman one time caught in the very act of adultery, dragged into the courtyard of the temple, thrown down in shame and humiliation before the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you remember what he said to her? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. On one occasion, he was approached by a leper. Lord, if you're willing, you could touch me and I could be made clean. And do you know what Jesus said? He said, bless his name, he said, I am willing. Be thou made clean. To a thieving tax collector shimmied up a sycamore fig tree. Based on nothing that Zacchaeus had to offer Jesus, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house. And by the way, I'm going because salvation has come to your house today. And then standing outside a a grave outside the city of Bethany to a dead corpse laid there for four days so that it began to rot and corrupt and begun to stink. Jesus Christ said, Lazarus, come forth. I'm telling you, when he speaks, he speaks with power and authority. And disease and disability, depravity and death move on because he's unique. Ain't nobody like him in what he says. But here in the opening verse of the book of Hebrews, you find a theological forest in an acorn of a few words. Therefore, holy brethren... Now, your translation may say, therefore, holy 
brothers and sisters. Now that's really in many ways the gospel in a nutshell. There ain't no story like this one because there ain't nobody like him. How does this little phrase picture and proclaim the gospel? Well, it tells us something that Jesus says about us. First of all, he declares that you are family. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Therefore, holy brethren. One translation says brothers and sisters because this Greek word references all the siblings of Jesus Christ, the sons and the daughters of God. No doubt this connects us to what was said of Jesus back in chapter 2 verse 11 that based on the finished work of the cross, he was not ashamed to call us his brethren. That Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and his sisters. Now, as I prepared for that text last week and this one today, I've thought a lot about the genealogy of the Son of God. I've preached about it many times through the years, from Luke chapter 3, from Matthew chapter 1. We've talked about how it's sprinkled throughout the pages of the Old Testament and Ezra and Nehemiah in the closing verses of Ruth. Throughout the Old Testament, we see the scarlet thread of redemption is weaving its way genealogically through an awful lot of scoundrels and 'er ne'er-do-wells. I think about Abraham, a lying, scheming man who is every bit as much the trickster as his grandson, Jacob, and yet he's in the genealogical line of Jesus. And then there's Jacob, whose name actually means heel-grabbing supplanter. We'd say his name means a bald-faced liar. Then Judah's in the family line of Jesus. The line of the tribe of Judah. Judah, who fathered his own grandson through an incestuous relationship. And if you know the book of Genesis, you know what his excuse was? I didn't know it was my daughter-in-law. I thought I was hiring a prostitute. Like, that's an excuse. And by the way, the would-be prostitute, Tamar, she's in the family line of Jesus too along with David, the murdering adulterer, Solomon, the womanizer. And how about Ruth and Rahab and Bathsheba? Not exactly the kind of girls you want to bring home from college to meet your mama. Yet you better be careful how you talk about them. They're the great, great, great grannies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time we go through the genealogical line of Jesus, we're blown away by the good news that God, by His mercy, can take sinners like that and put them into the family tree of Jesus. And might I add, they're not in the family tree of Jesus because because their blood is in Him. They're in the family line of Jesus because His blood, by grace through faith, got on them. But I've come today to tell you there's one scoundrel in the family of God whose placement in the family of Jesus blows my mind and rings my bell, amazes me more than anybody else. And that scoundrel that I can't believe is in the family of God is me. When I think about what I've done, when I think about where I've been, what I've said, what I've thought, how I've sinned against the Lord. All I can say is thanks be to God for grace. Thanks be to God that he said something about me and declared me to be a son of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul comments on this truth in the book of 1 Timothy and says that he was the worst of all sinners. But for that very reason, God showed him grace to hold him up as an example of the patience that God would give to anyone and everyone that would come in repentance and faith. The idea is if Paul can be saved, anybody can be saved. That's what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 7 and verse 25, that Christ is now able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. I'm telling you, there ain't nobody like him. Nobody else can do that for you. Listen to me. Nobody else can forgive you of your sin, wash you clean in the presence of God, and prepare you to face the Lord God in judgment. I'm not trying to be offensive today, but Buddha can't do that for you. Confucius can't do that for you. Muhammad can't do that for you. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but Muhammad and uh, Joseph Smith can't do that for you. The Pope can't do that for you. Pastor Mike can't do that for you. Your mama and your daddy can't do that for you. 
Joining the church can't do that for you. Walking the aisle can't do that for you. Praying a prayer can't do that for you. Joining the church can't do that for you. Going through the baptistry can't do that for you. Showing up in Sunday school. You ought to have shown up in Sunday school today, but that by itself will not take you to heaven. You need somebody not to just, just try to get to heaven by your good work, but somebody who will do a great work and take you to heaven, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. I've come to praise him today because there ain't nobody like him. In what he says, he declares that you are family. But he says something else. He decrees that you are forgiven. For he doesn't merely say, therefore, brethren, therefore, holy brethren. This is a statement of fact. It pictures for us the doctrine of justification. Now, the Bible teaches that we are to be holy in our practice. The Bible says we're to pursue holiness without which no man shall see God. The Bible says you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. But in this case, the word holy is not referencing practical holiness. This is talking about positional holiness. Not how you act, but who you are. Not what you say, but what Christ has said about you. Not what your neighbor says, but what Jesus says. Now, if you don't think that I believe in preaching practical righteousness and practical holiness, come back tonight for our lesson in Judges 2, and we'll skin the cat tonight. But this word holy is not about a demand to be holy. This word is about a declaration that you already are. Holy. Because of what Christ has done. Tom Schreiner in his commentary writes, They are his holy brothers and sisters since they've been cleansed of their sin through Jesus' propitiatory sacrifice. Propitiation is a word that we saw last week in the text. And it just simply means that the righteous demands of God have been satisfied. We sang the gospel a few minutes ago when we said, Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Some years ago, I was witnessing to a man in Waycross. And after he finished telling me what a good moral man he was, he said, Preacher, you need to know something. I don't have a problem with you. I don't have a problem with your church. And I don't have a problem with God. And I said, Sir, you don't seem to understand If you're not saved, the question is not, do you have a problem with God? God's got a problem with you. And you need someone to abate the wrath of God, pay the penalty for your sin. You may not know the word, brother or sister, but you need somebody to propitiate for your sins. And only Jesus can do that. But bless his name, Jesus has done that and calls us holy brothers and sisters. The primary focus of Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll get into it in our next couple of installments, is that Jesus is better than Moses, that Jesus is better than Aaron, that Jesus is better than Joshua. Jesus is better than all of the leaders and the system of the Old Testament. Why is Jesus better than Moses? Because Jesus did something for you that Moses could never do. As the great lawgiver Moses told you what to do, As the great lover of your soul and friend of sinners, Jesus knew that you could not do what his righteousness demanded that you do. So he took on a body of flesh and blood, came into this sin-cursed world, met all the righteous demands, followed every command that God had required for salvation. Thirty-three and a half years with never an evil thought, never a wicked deed, never a sinful action. Died as a substitute on the cross for your sin. Moses couldn't do that for you. As the great lawgiver Moses gave you commandments, Jesus came and fulfilled those commands. Moses called you a sinner, but he couldn't do anything about it. Jesus did something about it. Stepping into this world, taking your sin upon himself, bearing and becoming your own sin, that he might grant you his holiness. Through the law, Moses said, you're wicked. But through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, God says you're not wicked. You're a holy brother of Christ. You're a holy sister of Christ. You've been born into the family. You are now family. You've been forgiven of your sin. I now decree that you are forgiven. 
when I see the Lord Jesus contrasted with Moses, I can't help but think about a well-known encounter of Jesus and the adulterous woman. You recall it's recorded in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. They've caught this unfortunate woman in the very act. And if you know the story, they're not concerned about righteousness and holiness. They're trying to get Jesus caught up in this little scheme. This woman is nothing more than a pawn to be abused and used. But they inevitably, and I think unintentionally, do something for that woman that she needed more than anything else. They brought her to Jesus Christ and asked a very important question. Jesus, the law of Moses says she should be stoned. But we want to know what you say. Somebody today needs to be brought spiritually to the feet of the Lord Jesus and to be reminded of what the law of God says about you is not good. But the real question is, what will Jesus say about you if you'll repent of your sin and call on the name of the Lord to be saved? The law says she was deserving of the wrath of God. But Jesus, what do you have to say? The law said of her and of us, guilty and condemned to die, But Jesus, what do you have to say? The law still says of me that I'm unclean, unfit for heaven. But Jesus, what do you have to say? The law says worthy of condemnation, judgment, and wrath. But Jesus, I've got a question. What do you have to say? The law says the pastor of the church is unworthy in and of myself to hang around respectable folk. But Jesus... What do you have to say? And you better lean in and listen to what he has to say because I've been talking about her and I've been talking about me, but I've also, by God's power, I've been talking about you. And you better lean into the Word of God to see what he has to say of those who repent and believe because the same voice that cried out from a cattle stall outside of Bethlehem, the same voice that said, Peace be still, the same voice that told Jairus' daughter to get up from the dead, the same voice that said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He looks into the face of the law. He looks into the face of people bound and chained under the curse of the law. And he says, if you'll repent, here's what I'll say of you. I'll say you're forgiven. I'll say you're born again. I'll say you're blood washed. I'll say you're ransomed. I'll say you're a child of God. I'll say you're a friend of God. I won't be ashamed in the presence of God to say, that one's my brother. That one's my sister. They get in because they're with me. They're righteous, blameless, holy, and sanctified. And the difference is, it doesn't matter what your neighbor said. It didn't matter what your mama said or your daddy said. It didn't matter what your ex-husband said. It didn't matter what your ex-wife said. On that day, all that will matter is what Jesus says about you. And what Jesus says matters because he's not lying when he says it. Because when he says it, it becomes true. He declares that you're family. He decrees that you're forgiven. And listen, friend, nobody else in all of history can do that for you. Ain't nobody like him in what he says. But now in this one verse we see secondly, ain't nobody like him in where he stands. Where he stands. Now this book of Hebrews repeatedly tells us that Jesus has ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. But what I mean by the word stands... Is describing his position. Where is he? I'll tell you where he stands. Jesus Christ stands between holy God and fallen man. And he stands there alone. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in none other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Speaking of the name of Jesus Christ. The night before he died, the master said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So he stands between holy God and sinful man right by himself. I came today to tell you there ain't nobody like him in where he stands. Well, where does he stand? Well, first of all, We see in the text, he's a messenger who was sent. A messenger who was sent. Here, we have a unique and interesting title for Jesus. He's called the Apostle. Now, Jesus had a number of apostles while he was on the earth. 
12 of them handpicked. One of them, of course, was a dud, a fraud, a fake, a counterfeit, and a betrayer. After he hanged himself, the disciples replaced him with Matthias. And then on the road to Damascus, Jesus himself called, converted, and commissioned Paul the apostle. But here, it's not Paul that's called an apostle. It's not Matthew who's given the title of apostle. It's not the beloved apostle John referenced in this text. But the Bible takes that title and applies it to the sinless Son of God, that Jesus Christ is the apostle. I think it's worth noting he's not an apostle, as if he's one of many. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate, preeminent apostle of God. Now, the word apostle just simply means one that is sent. Specifically, one that is sent on a mission. Or one that is sent with a message. This word for apostle is used several times by the Lord Jesus himself. In Luke 4, 18, when he sat in the temple and read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, and he has sent me, he has apostled me to bind up the brokenhearted. This, this same word is also used in Luke 4, 43, when Jesus explained why he was leaving one village going to another. He said, I must go preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for that is the reason I was sent. The reason I was apostled is to come and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God and to tell men and women and boys and girls how they could be reconciled to the Father. My favorite usage of this word, though, by the Lord Jesus is found right after John 3:16. In John 3, 17, Jesus said, For God did not send His Son into the world. God did not apostle His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus came as a messenger with a message. And what was His message? Well, quite frankly, He preached everywhere He went about Himself. He's the only preacher that's ever walked the face of the earth that can do that and not get in trouble with God. Jesus should be the sum total and centerpiece of every message of the gospel that's ever been preached. And Jesus was content to preach about himself. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You want to hear a word from God? The Bible says in the opening of Hebrews, God spoke to us in a lot of different ways in times past, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. You want to hear a word from God? You'll have to hear it from Jesus. What will He say? He'll say, I am the light of the world. He that walks with me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He will say what He said in the past. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He will say, come unto me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You want to hear a word from God? It'll come from Jesus except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish you want to hear a word from God it'll sound like Jesus speaking seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you you want to hear a message from God you'll hear it from the lips of Jesus he that believes in the son has the life he that does not believe does not have the life he that believes will not be condemned he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ is the apostle, a messenger who was sent, but he stands between holy God and fallen man also in that he is a mediator who was sacrificed. For here he is not only rendered as the apostle, but the high priest of our confession. Now, these two titles remind us of the uniqueness of the work of Jesus Christ. As an apostle, he came with a message from God to man. He spoke to mankind on behalf of God. As high priest, he has now returned to the Father and speaks to God on behalf of man. What did he say when he came from God to man? He said, you need to repent of your sin if you have any hope of eternal life. What does he say to God on behalf of man? Well, when we get to glory, he's going to say, Father, this one's with me. This one's my brother. This one's my sister. This one's a member of the family. 
He intercedes for us because he ever lives to make intercession. One songwriter put it this way, that Jesus built a bridge to heaven so that I could have a way up to him. Jesus built a bridge the only way that he could with only three nails and two pieces of wood. With one rugged cross, Jesus built a bridge. The cross of Jesus Christ is a neon sign from God telling you that if you want to be saved, you can be saved. But if you want to be saved, you can be saved. But you've got to be saved by Jesus Christ. And beloved, if you want to be saved, you can be saved. You've got to be saved by Jesus. But you've got to be saved through the power of the cross of Christ. Now the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. But unto us which are being saved, it is the very power of God. Jesus Christ is a mediator who is sacrificed. Again, this is just another way the writer tells us that Jesus is greater than Moses and the Old Testament system. For when those ancient priests came into the tabernacle and later into the temple of God, on the Day of Atonement, they brought two sacrifices. The Bible tells us that first of all, they offered a sacrifice for their own sin. And then they offered that second sacrifice for the sins of the people. But when Jesus came... Jesus only offered one sacrifice. He did not need to offer a sacrifice for his own sin. He had no sin. The sins for which he died at the cross were my sins and yours. So when he laid down his life, he just offered one sacrifice. Couldn't find a sacrifice worthy enough. So he just offered himself as a sacrifice. And the writer of Hebrews will tell us in chapter 7, verse 26 and following... It was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need like those high priests, those priests in the past, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because he did this, that sacrifice, once for all time when he offered up himself. No other sacrifice could mediate between sinful man and holy God. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. The wrath of God was indeed satisfied. And that's why when Jesus got back to the right hand of God the Father, he did something that earthly priests never do. He sat down because his work was finished. He did something no other priest had ever done because he was unlike any other priest. There ain't nobody like him. In where he stands. There ain't nobody like him in what he says. Thirdly, and this is the climax of the message for this preacher. Nobody like him in who he saves. Ain't nobody going to save you like Jesus can. On August the 27th, Officer De Leon with the NYPD's 78th Precinct was walking down a sidewalk in the Big Apple. When a woman came out of a parked car holding a, an unconscious toddler in her hand, her precious little boy had stopped breathing. She didn't know what to do. And as if by the grace of God, she saw a uniformed police officer. She bounded from that parked vehicle and handed that limp and seemingly lifeless little boy to the officer. Performing CPR, the little boy began to cry. The precious little boy began to breathe. As heroic as that act of bravery was, it's really not that uncommon. I doubt a day goes by that some first responder doesn't perform some act of medical emergency, the Heimlich maneuver, CPR, some injection, some surgery, some procedure. We'd say just in the nick of time, and that one person saves one other person. On January the 15th of 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from New York's LaGuardia Airport. Shortly after takeoff, a flock of birds crashed into that engine. And John Sully, the captain of that jet, became famous for what has been known as the miracle on the Hudson. He set that big bird down right in the Hudson River, saving 150 passengers and all five crew members. That man saved 155 people. But with the deepest respect for his experience and skill, that's not the first, nor was it the last time 
that a pilot set down a plane with an emergency landing, saving himself and all the passengers on board. It was January the 26th, 1945, that a 19-year-old soldier named Audie Murphy single-handedly held off an attack from an entire German battalion, saving the lives of hundreds of men wearing the uniform of the United States, thereby becoming the most decorated man in all of World War II history and would later become a star of screen and television alike. But 2,000 years ago, a Galilean carpenter came from heaven and came from Nazareth, went up to a hill called Golgotha and laid down his life willingly and voluntarily. Listen to me, not just to save one, not just to save 155, and not just to save a couple hundred of his closest friends, but the beloved apostle John said in 1 John 2 verse 2 that he laid down his life as a propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Lean in close and listen to me. Ain't nobody ever done nothing for you like Jesus has done. I apologize for the bad grammar, but that's pretty good preaching if I say so myself. Ain't nobody like him in who he saves. Well, who does he save? Pastor Mike, how could I get in on that salvation? Who's included in this glorious offer of grace? Well, there are two qualifications that must be met. We find them both right here in this one little verse. First, he saves those with a heavenly calling. Did you see it? Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled by theologians for nearly 2,000 years trying to discern, describe, and define this call. Is it a call from somewhere or is it a call to somewhere? I mean, is it a call from heaven or is it a call to heaven? Is it a call from somebody or is it a call to somebody? You'd be amazed how people write books and conferences trying to answer that question. And I'm going to answer the question right here. The answer is yes. It's a call from God to you. It's a call from heaven to sinners on the earth. It's a call from a life of rebellion to a life of forgiveness. It's a call from the Father to His children. More specifically, it's a call from Jesus Christ to you. Partakers of a heavenly calling. David Allen writes in his commentary that whether the author's intent was to suggest the call was from heaven or to heaven or both, it really is a moot point since both are true theologically. One thing is for sure, and you need to pay close attention to it. You do not, will not, and cannot initiate this call. Salvation is of the Lord. You cannot just wake up one day and say, you know what? Weather looks great. Think I'll get saved today. You can't say, you know, mama's been on my back. Think I'm going to get saved today. Kids are fussing. Life's in shambles. Marriage in ruin. I know what I'll do. I'll give my life to Jesus. I just think I'll get saved saved today. That all sounds good. One problem with it. You can't do that. You can't get saved anytime you want to any more than I think anybody in this room can get your cell phone and call the private cell number of the President of the United States. You don't have his number. You don't have the ability to call on him. And I dare say if you were to ever get the number of the President of the United States and call him You're calling him back. You're returning his call. The only way you have the knowledge to call him back, the ability to call him back, is he first called on you. And that's a picture of salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But beloved, you can't call him anytime you want to. You've got to call. You've got to answer when he's calling you. I want to ask you today. You think the Lord's calling you? 
Is there a stirring in your soul that you've never been saved and you want to be saved today? Is this message today more than just coming to church? More than just going through the motions? I mean, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Your problem is you. Your problem is God has a problem with your sin. And if there is a stirring in your heart, a longing in your soul, may I submit to you this morning, that's God calling. You ought to answer the call. It's no more polite to refuse to answer the call of God than when your mama calls you. Don't send her to voicemail. And don't send God to voicemail. Listen to me now. He don't have to call you again. You can't get saved anytime you want to. And if the Lord is dealing with your heart to come to Christ today, later in this text we will be admonished, don't harden your heart. You better come and respond while today is still called today. Who does God save? He saves those with a heavenly calling. Secondly, he saves those with a holy confession. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, one text renders that word as our profession. That's a good word. Because while the Bible does tell us that we must confess our sins, this word is not describing or referencing the confession of sin. It's describing the confession of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's professing Christ as Lord and Savior. It's saying the same thing about Jesus that God the Father says about Jesus. That this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. He might say, this is my beloved Son, Jesus. Do what He tells you to do. And what does he tell you to do? He tells you to repent and believe the gospel. This word confession is the same word found in Romans 10 and verse 9. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, not confess how bad you are, not confess how wicked you are, not confess how far you've fallen or how deeply you've strayed and sinned, but if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. That if you will open up your mouth. And believe in your heart that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And did what he said he would do. The Bible says that holy confession. Will pass you from death to life. Your sins can be forgiven and you can be reconciled to God. You can be saved. John Phillips comments here that this is not something earned as a result of accumulated merit, but something sovereignly bestowed upon him, upon a man or a woman, because of Christ's finished work. That's what the hymn writer described as marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed as a gift on all who believe. I can't help but think about that woman from John 8 caught in the very act of adultery woman where are your accusers they're gone Lord then neither do I condemn you go and sin no more and based on her profession they're gone Lord and his forgiveness of her sin I believe one day we'll meet that woman in heaven and uh, somebody may ask her, did your story even belong in the Bible? But that's another sermon. As she enters into the gates of glory, you may meet her one day and say, how'd you get here? She may say, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No one else could heal all my souls diseases no not one no not one was there a friend that's so high and holy 
No, not one, no, not one, and yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. I like this. Was e'er a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one. No, not one. That's just a fancier, nicer way of saying you better cling to Jesus Christ because ain't nobody like him.